Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore, and welcome to the first episode of a new show called Reality Asserts Itself. In this show, I'm going to be interviewing people I find interesting, and I hope you will. And we're going to talk about big ideas, but mostly after we talk about big ideas, we're going to talk about what to do next. Now joining us for the inaugural interview is Chris Hedges. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a senior fellow at the Nation Institute. He spent nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. He's reported for more than 50 countries and has worked for the Christian Science Monitor, National Public Radio, and the New York Times, for which he was a foreign correspondent for 15 years. He's received the Amnesty International Global Award for Human Rights Journalism in 2002 and is the author, with Joe Sacco, of several books including the New York Times bestseller, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. And he writes a weekly column for Truth Dig. Chris also holds a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard University, and he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley, California. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. So start with, uh, and, uh, and just for viewers, most of my interviews on this show are going to start with who my guest is, and a little bit more why they think what they think, and then we're going to get more into what they think. So, and these will be multiple episodes. So start, start with how do you get from being a seminary student, a religious man, one would assume, um, to a mainstream journalist, to a career-ending, mainstream career-ending at any rate speech in Rockford College in 2003. But take us back to be, that, the, the path that led you to be a, a seminary student in the first place. Well, I was always a writer, and I wrote compulsively. Uh, the language as a form of music was something that dominated my life from the age of four or five. Uh, I wrote poems, short stories. I published my first piece in a historical journal when I was 12. I published my first piece of journalism in the Christian Science Monitor when I was still in college. Um, but I could never square the uh, supposed neutrality and objectivity of journalism with the social commitment that was inculcated uh, within me primarily by my father who was a Presbyterian minister uh, and was very involved in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement and the gay rights movement in the 1970s. Very controversial stance. Uh, his youngest brother, my uncle, was gay. Uh, and my father was very outspoken on behalf of gay rights, something which uh, the church, the institutional church, uh, had great difficulty with. So you grew up with a father who was a rebel? Yes. With religious roots, but a rebel. Right. And, Christian. right. And, you know, I, I, I still, although probably uh, would not formally consider myself religious, honor that tradition of, uh, one could call it Christian anarchism, which is the kind of term they use to describe Dorothy Day and the Catholic worker, uh, and went to seminary really in part. Uh, I suppose I was clashing with my nature, but I went to seminary because I felt that uh, that social commitment was paramount. So when I graduated from Colgate University, I moved into uh, the ghetto, into the inner city in Boston, in Roxbury, and ran a church across the street from one of the most notorious housing projects in Boston, Mission Main Mission Extension. Well, most of people doing that at that time would have, like the worker priests and such, I mean, they would have considered themselves religious and the way to express that was through this kind of social commitment. Right. You were not religious? And if no, not, I was. I wanted to you, be an inner city minister. I, so you, I, you know, I, I was at the time. I was planning on being ordained. I was planning on spending my life in the inner city. And I had uh, a kind of clash, and I write about it in the first chapter of my book, Losing Moses on the Freeway, The Ten Commandments in America, with the institutional church and liberal institutions like Harvard Divinity School that liked the poor but didn't like the smell of the poor. Um, they spent a lot of time talking about empowering people they never met. And that hypocrisy was something that I had great difficulty with. I also, my second year at Harvard, uh, became uh, friends with a guy named Robert Cox, who had been the editor of the Buenos Aires Herald at the time of the Dirty War in Argentina. And uh, he was the only newspaper editor every day to print the names of the disappeared, the desaparecidos, on the front page above the fold. Uh, uh, an act of tremendous courage uh, 
that uh, eventually saw him disappear, taken away by the Falconeros, and the only reason I think he survived is because he is a British citizen or was a British citizen. And he was at the Neiman Foundation at Harvard. And that was a very important relationship for me because it wedded the love I had of language and of writing with the uh, commitment to um, social justice uh, that mainstream journalism uh, said uh, was an anathema uh, to their uh, creed of objectivity and impartiality and neutrality, which of course I later came to learn is a kind of subterfuge. Uh, it's not true, of course. Um, and, uh, and what I did was leave for Latin America. I, I uh, finished my second year of uh, divinity school, uh, went and studied Spanish in Bolivia with the Marinol Fathers, the Catholic Missionary Society, ended up in Argentina, covered the Falkland War for National Public Radio from Buenos Aires, <clears throat> went back to divinity school, graduated, uh, and then turned around and went to El Salvador to be a freelance reporter and was five years in Central America. So, so is that a big decision for you not <clears throat> to continue? You were planning to, to be in the ministry, and now you're off right. to Latin America not as a journalist. Not really, because, I mean, I went ha you know, you're approved for ordination before you go into divinity school. Um, and uh, I had done all of the academic work. All I had at that point was to tell my committee what my call was, your call to be you know, a chaplain or an associate pastor somewhere or something. And I said, well, I'm going to El Salvador to cover the war as a freelance reporter. And there was a long pause, and the head of the committee said, well, we don't ordain journalists. Uh, and it, my dad, who was seated outside the room at the time, um, you know, 40 years in the, as a parish minister, his only comment was, you're ordained to write. And I've always placed myself in or amongst the oppressed. Uh, whether that was in Gaza, whether that was in El Salvador, whether that was in Sarajevo. I've always positioned myself as a reporter in a place where I was amplifying or giving voice to those who were being brutally oppressed. So how did you last at the New York Times for 15 years with think thoughts like that? Because nobody wants to go to Gaza. Nobody wants to. When I told the executive editor of the New York Times that I wanted to go to Sarajevo. At that point, 45 foreign correspondents had been killed, dozens wounded. Uh, he said, well, I guess the line starts and ends with you. Um, they would much rather sit in Paris or follow the Secretary of State around. Uh, and yet, institutions like the New York Times need reporters who are willing to go in those places. And, and those were the only places I wanted to go into. Uh, and so I actually had um, uh, a, f a fairly, uh, you know, uh, prominent and rewarded career at the Times uh, because I was quite selective about where I went. For instance, I covered the first Gulf War and I had no interest in going to the press conferences run by Schwarzkopf or anywhere else. And so I was always out on the front lines interviewing Lance Corporals, sleeping in foxholes. I went into Kuwait uh, with the Marine Corps. Uh, I, I was always reporting, you know, like Ernie Pyle or somebody else from in war zones, from with the sort of average soldier marine. And newspapers needed it. I mean, e indeed, the, my reporting for the first Gulf War was submitted by the New York Times for the Pulitzer. Um, uh, so it, I was selective about where I placed myself and, and what I was doing. Uh, and because there wasn't much competition, uh, partly because that kind of work is dangerous and partly because it's not prestigious. I mean, there's a whole element at elite journalistic institutions like the Times that want to hang around with the powerful, that want uh, to sort of, in essence, be integrated into uh, the circle of the power elite, and I never had any interest in that. Now, you, you are still able to keep within the bounds of keeping your job. Did you ever have to uh, compromise in any way? Did you find any editorial interference? Uh, I, I, this is all leading up to the speech right. where clearly they didn't like. Well, let's be clear. I mean, American journalism, unlike European journalism, is quite restrictive in its form. Uh, and you ingest the form of the New York Times. You know how to write a New York Times story. Um, uh, so the form itself precludes, it, it, the boundaries are so narrow uh, that you can't do the, do the kinds of things you could do if you were writing for Liberation or, or The Guardian or something, uh, which is make comments uh, outside that, that would be considered editorializing. Uh, so the form itself con is constrictive. That's the first part. Um, the second part is that um, 
I, because I was writing on the ground, I mean, even though I was in Gaza, uh, I was writing what I saw. So I've, I was in Gaza, for instance, when Israeli F-16s bombed Gaza. I went to the site where the bombing was. I counted the numbers of corpses. I described those who appeared to be children or those. It was, it was quite hands-on. So if you, as long as you're saying this happened, that right. happened, you can verify what you're right. saying, and they, yet, they would print it. Right, and yet, of course, the Israelis hated that reporting because the spin they were putting out of it uh, on that particular incident you know, they would always talk about a surgical strike against a bomb-making unit. Well, you know, dropping a 500-pound iron fragmentation bomb in a densely uh, populated refugee camp is not a surgical strike. Uh, and half the time, there weren't any bomb makers uh, anywhere nearby. I mean, you, you know, when you, when you get on the ground. Uh, and so uh, that reporting rankled uh, the Israelis quite a bit. Uh, now, logistically, living in Gaza at the time was very unpleasant. Getting to the site where an attack was was extremely difficult. About 60% of my time was just spent trying to get where something happened. Uh, and a lot of reporters didn't want to do it. A lot of reporters didn't want to be in Kosovo, didn't want to be in Bosnia, didn't want to be in these physically difficult places. Uh, uh, but once I was there, I would say the, the paper was quite ha happy to have it. Part, part of most Americans' religion whether they are religious or not, in terms of the way they identify, is Americanism. You know, you, you go to school and right. you put your hand on your chest and I pledge allegiance. Uh, when, when you're younger, growing up, going to seminary school, uh, you know, before you start uh, realizing what's going on in Latin America and the Middle East, how much is Americanism part of you? Not much, because uh, because although I was a kid, my father was hauling me off to anti-war demonstrations and in fact told me when I was about 12 or something that if the Vietnam War was still being fought when I was 18 and I was drafted, he would go to prison with me. And I still have this like vision of sitting like for two years in a jail cell with my dad. Um, so that forces you to, and he, by the way, he was a vet. He was a sergeant in North Africa. No, he was a sergeant in North Africa in World War II. So, I mean, he wore something he knew. Although he was a cryptographer, he was, he was around combat units. So um, uh, those made me ask questions. Uh, and uh, I, I grew up in a very rural, uh, all-white farm town in upstate New York where my father's open support for uh, Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement was quite contentious. Martin Luther King in these rural white enclaves at that time, in the 60s, was one of the most hated men in America. And then to see my father come out in terms of, in support of gay rights. Uh, so my father was a kind of lightning rod throughout his life. And your father would, would have been radicalized in the 30s. Well, I think my father was, was like many of his generation, radicalized by World War II. Uh, we've mythologized World War II. Uh, he and most of my uncles were in the war. Uh, I had one uncle that was physically and emotionally destroyed in the South Pacific, drank himself to death in a trailer. I mean, and, and I think that that wasn't uncommon with combat vets who suffered from what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. There was no name for it then and very little understanding or sympathy. So even though my uncle, for instance, mailed all of his medals back uh, to the Pentagon. Uh, he hated war. He was destroyed by war. And our family, he was an, you know, an embarrassment. I mean, there was no alcohol in the manse where I grew up, and yet my uncle was a drunk. And uh, it, it, you know, I think there were probably tens of thousands of families who were caring for people who had been psychologically and physically maimed, but they were shunted aside. Uh, um, because they didn't fit that kind of mythic narrative. And I really grew up because of that in the shadow of, of World War II. The shadow of the war fell upon my family. Um, and so, um, you know, all of those factors and all of the stances that my father took meant that I was forced at a young age to ask questions that maybe, you know, many of my peers were not asking. So when you go to Latin America and then you go to the Middle East, this is not a big surprise to you what U.S. foreign policy is. If anything, it's more a confirmation of a lot of things your father was saying. Well, you know, I would say actually the really seminal moment was moving into the inner city 
and watching what we do to our poor, uh, the warehousing of our poor, the shattering of lives, especially the lives of children, of poor children. Um, that maybe rattled me more than almost anything I saw, and I've seen horrific things. Uh, I remember going back to the chaplain at Colgate after a few months of living in the projects and uh, just sit, walking into his office and sitting down and saying, are we created to suffer? And his answer was, is there any love that isn't? Um, and I think for a white person of relative privilege uh, to confront the cruelty of what we do to poor people of color in this country and to begin to understand institutional forms of racism, all the mechanisms by which we ensure uh, that the poor remain poor in you know, what Malcolm X and Martin Luther King correctly called these internal colonies, uh, really rattled me, uh, really shook me. Uh, it made me question um, all sorts of things. Uh, the myth we tell ourselves about ourselves, the nature of capitalism, the nature of racism, um, exploitation. Uh, so uh, that, those two and a half years I spent in Roxbury were quite profound. Uh, not that, of course, I wasn't uh, stunned at the evils of empire in places like El Salvador uh, or Gaza or anywhere else, um, but Roxbury was, was quite a shock for me. Okay, in part two of our interview with Chris, we're going to pick up the story with his, what is, we now know, was a career-ending speech in 2003 at Rockford College. Please join us for part two of our series of interviews with Chris Hedges on The Real News Network. Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. Welcome to part two of our series of interviews with Chris Hedges on our new show, Reality Asserts Itself. Chris is a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, a senior fellow at the Nation Institute. He spent nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. He's reported for more than 50 countries for the Christian Science Monitor, National Public Radio, the New York Times, for which he was a foreign correspondent for 15 years. You can read more of Chris's bi biography down below this video player here, and we're going to go right to Chris. Thanks for joining us again. So p pick up the story at, at this Rockford College uh, speech. Now, just to remind people that don't know the story, um, Chris made a speech uh, critiquing the Iraq War, which led to him and New York Times going in uh, their own directions, in different directions. Uh, as you're about to make this speech, uh, do you realize, one, how controversial it's going to be at the moment of making the speech, and do you realize you're going to have this big fight that, that results in you leaving the Times? No, um, and yet, uh, I had spent my career as a foreign correspondent, and Sidney Shanberg, who worked for many years for the Times and was eventually pushed out of the paper as the Metro editor for taking on the developers who were friends with the publisher and who were driving the working in the middle class out of Manhattan, so now Manhattan's become the playground of hedge fund managers primarily, says correctly that uh, your freedom as a reporter is constricted uh, in direct proportion to your distance from the centers of power. Uh, so if you're reporting from Latin America or Gaza or the Middle East as I was, uh, or the Balkans, you have a kind of range uh, that is denied to you once you come back into New York and into Washington. So for instance, I could go on national public radio and uh, offer a very frank critique about Slobodan Milosevic and what he was doing in Bosnia, what the Serbs were doing in Bosnia. But to come back to the United States and be that candid about George W. Bush uh, was to get me in deep trouble. Uh, and yet, uh, having spent seven years in the Middle East, having been the Middle East bureau chief for the New York Times, an Arabic speaker, months of my life in Iraq, I understood like most Arabists that uh, the invasion of Iraq was based on a fantasy, uh, 
the idea that we would be greeted as liberators, that uh, democracy would be implanted in Baghdad and emanate outwards across the Middle East, that uh, the oil revenues would pay for reconstruction. Uh, all of this was absurd. And all the Arabists knew it. They knew it in the State Department, they knew it in the Pentagon, they knew it in the CIA. Uh, and certainly those reporters who had spent time in the Middle East knew it. And yet to speak out was a career killer. Uh, and yet I knew, as subsequently happened, that people I cared about would die uh, in Iraq and other places uh, because of this policy. And I felt that I had a kind of moral imperative to speak even at the expense of my career. Uh, when I went to Rockford College, I knew nothing about the college except that Jane Addams, a socialist and a pacifist who had been booed off the stage at Carnegie Hall for denouncing World War I, I had been a graduate. I did not know that subsequently the trustees had tried to posthumously revoke her diploma. Uh, and so uh, I spoke as I had been speaking about the war. Uh, it engendered a, a very negative Paint response. a picture of where you're well, at, it was, who's a there. I was, I, it was the commencement address, and I think they thought they were going to get the follow your dream speech, which is what every commencement speaker is hired to give, but I was not prepared to give. Um, and uh, so it was a thousand people. Uh, I began my speech. Um, uh, uh, people started booing and hissing. My microphone was cut twice. Uh, at one point, the crowd got up and began singing God Bless America. But where is Rockford College? Rockford, Illinois. And, uh, and then two young men uh, in robes from the graduating class got up and tried to push me away from the podium. Uh, I had to cut my speech short. Uh, the security came and removed me from the podium before the awarding of diplomas. I remember getting down, I had an academic gown on, and I said, well, my, my jacket's in the president's office, and they said, we'll mail it to you. Uh, they took me to my hotel, watched me pack my bags, and put me on a bus to Chicago. Why did they invite you? I don't know. I, because but, I did they not read your column? Well, you know, I think they thought that most commencement speakers bend to the occasion and give the uh, usual soporific, boring, and instantly forgettable commencement address. And I just uh, wasn't interested in playing that game. Uh, uh, I did tell them, I remember at breakfast, that I was going to speak about the Iraq. Well, I don't think any of us knew. They probably didn't know how frank I was going to be. Uh, I, think there was, I think we were all sort of clueless as to the reaction. Yeah, you must have been surprised yourself at students well, reacting this sure. way. Sure. It was very hostile uh, and frightening. I mean, when you have a thousand people who really don't like you, I'm not going to pretend it's now, easy. This is 2003. 2003. So there, there is a big anti-war movement all around the world. Right. But uh, you have to remember that in 2003, it was mission accomplished. Uh, we were celebrating the fall of Baghdad. Uh, people were reveling in the power and virtues of, of the American empire. Uh, and it was very lonely for those of us who were speaking out against the war. There were very few voices, but we've rewritten that history pretty well. Uh, but and, and, there were not a lot of yeah, voices. Yeah, the big protests are before the invasion. Yeah, and, and the general public is deeply uh, sympathetic to the war effort. Uh, and, and most of the intellectual class and are either silent or complicit. So what, what goes it through your mind as you decide to make this speech? Uh, you must have had some sense in that post-invasion period that this was going to be controversial well, and booed. the I, Times well, may not like this. Yeah, I've been booed. And I, well, because my career was never the point. I mean, you don't volunteer to go to Sarajevo if you're a careerist. I mean, you can get killed. I mean, uh, I, I, w I was never trying to build a career. That, that isn't why I was a journalist, um, you know, that, which again sort of makes you an anathema at a place like the New York Times, where for most people it's all about the career. Um, so I, I didn't care about my career. Um, so I didn't it wasn't take a big those decision. This was the next thing you were going to do. Well, I didn't know I was going to part ways with the Times, but at the same time I wasn't about to be silent. Uh, I was certainly willing to accept whatever costs came with speaking what I thought was the truth. Uh, and, and those costs did come because what happened was that you got the home movie footage that was picked up by Fox and all these right-wing trash talk cable shows and they loop them. You know, they, they run them every hour, they pull out a little bit with the you know, loudest parts of the booze uh, and, uh, and that pressured the Times to respond. And so the way the Times responded was to call me in and give me a formal written reprimand 
for impugning the impartiality of the New York Times, uh, and that I was gilled, your union. So the process is you give the employee the reprimand in written form, and then the next time they violate, under guild rules, you can fire them. So it was clear that we were headed for a collision. Either I muzzled myself to pay fealty to my career, which on a personal sense would be to betray my father, uh, uh, or I spoke out uh, and realized that uh, my relationship with my employer was terminal. And so at that point, uh, I left before they got rid of me, but I, uh, I knew uh, that it, you know, I wasn't gonna be able to stay. This decision that it was never about career, and, and as we said in part one, and if you haven't watched part one, you really should watch part one and then watch part two. It was in the beginning, you were a religious man, and, and this self-sacrifice had religious roots and religious grammar to it. Did it still at this time? Yeah, and it still does today. I mean, you, you can't grow up as I grew up in the church. You can't graduate from divinity school as I did uh, and not have uh, that way of looking at the world and looking at your role in the world deeply ingrained within you. Uh, I have great problems with institutional religion, uh, but the religious impulse the moral imperative is something that I, that I hold fast to and that I think comes out of my roots. So, which leads you to not compromise with the times. Right, or so, anyone else. So what happens? Uh, you, you, you realize this is ha going to part ways. What, well, what I had written a book called War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, um, which I w was pretty certain no one was ever gonna read, uh, especially with a title like that. Um, and I was cooked. I wasn't gonna get a job anywhere in journalism. In American journalism, I... Uh, You're already out of the Times. Oh, yeah, when I left. So I thought I was going to teach high school and coach track. I used to be a runner in college. So Did you actually get fired by the Times? No. Or you, you decide to leave? No, you... I left to go to the Nation Institute because I didn't stop speaking out about the war, and so it was only a matter of time. Now, with the written reprimand, it was clear that the next time there was a blow-up, they could get rid of me. And so I wasn't going to wait. I mean, I was going to be proactive. I was going to arrange for a transition to get out before I was fired, but it was clear that I was gonna be fired. Now this has gotta be a big cut in pay. Yeah, you know, what well, the uh, irony you is got, that, that- You got kids? Yeah, that, well, the big thing was the pension, you know, and medical, I lose medical, I lose pension. Uh, but my book sold, War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning, sold 300,000 copies. Um, so it was on the basis of that that I could, I, wish, I didn't get much of an advance for that, but on the basis of those sales, I then could get a substantial advance to keep writing. And um, I really didn't take a deep economic hit at all um, because uh, I, I was able, and I've been largely now over the last decade to sustain those book sales enough that I can, um, I can live on it uh, and I can, I can do another book. I've not sold, no, no book I've written has sold 300,000 copies, um, but they've sold significantly. Um, and, uh, but I didn't foresee that at the time. I, I uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. So what do you make of, I guess, the New York Times charge against you would have been that you've crossed the line from journalism to activism. They're, they're accusing Glenn Greenwald of that with right. his coverage of Snowden. Um, and, of course, at the Real News, we, we get right. that often enough. Uh, what do you make of that whole line of argument? Well, let's, I mean, let's look at what I was being reprimanded for. I was being reprimanded for... Uh, challenging a non-reality based belief system perpetuated by the Bush administration and in particular figures like Dick Cheney and Richard Pearl and Paul Wolfowitz who don't know anything about the instrument of war which I happen to know very well or about the Middle East. Um, I was speaking out of a body of experience. I was speaking out of a cultural understanding, a political understanding, uh, a religious understanding that they didn't have. And um, this wasn't a political opinion. This was based on years of experience uh, in the region and in particular in Iraq. Uh, but it was uh, a counter narrative uh, that challenged a narrative that was complete fiction. Um, and so uh, what I was being reprimanded for, if you really wanna boil it down to its simplest element, was for speaking 
a truth that was at that moment unpalatable. I was going to mention at that moment, because is there also not something specific about that moment? It's just that it's not that long after 9-11. Right. It's just after the invasion. And it's at these moments, the American media, which under in other moments might have actually maybe not have made such an issue of what you said, they, they, they collapse, they cave at these moments as much as they did during the House of Un-American Activities. Yeah, but Committee. they've also caved on Bradley Manning and Snowden and Julian Assange and WikiLeaks. Um, I mean, I think the media, the American media uh, at its best, which is, um, you know, institutions like the New York Times have become anemic, and at its worst, which is the commercial airwaves, have just become uh, tools of corporate propaganda. Uh, and th there's a crisis uh, within the media establishment that is very, very profound and very frightening. And is there also something about the New York Times, the Washington Post, and um, you know, pretty much most, if not all, the mainstream media, that there's certain things that, that are systemically threatening? Uh, they usually use the label national security to, to talk about those things. But when, it, when we're in that area, uh, that's where they will really intervene editorially. And even if you have done what you said earlier, you're, you're fact-based, you know, what you're doing is a, a, a refuting mythology. But this has just gotten too sensitive, you could say, for the class interests of the people that are running these newspapers and, and their relationship to the state. Yes. Um, and I think that the New York Times, uh, to illustrate the point that you've made, of course, you have to go back and look at the New York Times coverage in the lead up to the war in Iraq, where they were fed bogus material by the Bush administration and printed it as fact. Uh, and then the administration would cite New York Times stories to bolster their case for war in Iraq in this kind of circular mendacity that was taking place between Washington and the power elite uh, at the Times. And I was covering al-Qaeda out of Paris and uh, working with French intelligence who were going insane over this plan to invade Iraq, which of course they knew the Iraqis had nothing to do with 9-11. Uh, and um, I would come back and meet with the investigative team at the paper uh, and express to them what French intelligence was saying and they would just dismiss it. Um, <clears throat> remember there was a kind of racism towards the French at the time jokes about French culture and French identity. I mean, I heard them even in the newsroom of the Times. So it's a kind of sickness. Nationalism is a disease. Uh, it, it really is about self-exaltation. And the flip side of nationalism is always racism. And we were uh, self-exalting racists. Uh, and I saw it, I've seen it in war after war, from the Falklands to Serbia to anywhere else. Um, you drink that very dark elixir uh, and you become insane. And we became insane because, uh, you know, I was in the Middle East right after 9-11 and uh, the Muslim world was appalled at what had been done in their name. Uh, these crimes against humanity that have been committed on American soil. Uh, and the way you fight terrorism is to isolate terrorists within their own society. And this goes all the way back to Solace writing about the Jakarthan Wars. It's not a new understanding. And we had gone a long way to doing that because of the attacks of 9-11. And if we had had the courage to be vulnerable, if we had built on that empathy that was being poured out towards us, um, we'd be far more secure and safe than we are today. Instead, we responded just the way Al-Qaeda and these groups wanted, which is to invade and begin dropping iron fragmentation bombs all over the Middle East, which resurrected the jihadist movement. And just to get back to the Times, the, the Times has the credibility to do this kind of stuff up to the war in Iraq, because they do allow a fair amount of fact-based reporting that actually is legitimate. So you kind of believe what the Times says. Right. Well, every article they wrote, which was a lie about weapons of mass destruction, you know, being part of Saddam Hussein's Iraq was technically fact-based. It was sourced high, you know, senior intelligence officials say. I mean, it was double-checked with other intelligence officials. Um, it was all within the rubric of American journalism, uh, legitimate journalism. It just happened to be a lie. And one, one could know, many people did know at the time. Well, but those people we never spoke to. That's, uh, that's my point. The you, French, you can construct whether, the verifiable stream, but you don't talk to the people that right. threaten what you want right. to say. So, um, and that, you know, that is the difference between news and truth. And I think the really great reporters uh, 
uh, care about truth more than they do about news. Uh, they're not the same thing. And remember, as journalists, our job is to manipulate facts. Uh, I did it for many years. I can take any set of facts and spin you a story any way you want. And if I'm very cynical, I can spin it in a way that I know is good for my career, but is not particularly truthful to my reader. Uh, and uh, I always attempted to uh, convey to my reader the truth. Uh, but reporters who keep hammering home the truth often become management problems, and they don't rise within the organization. You know within the institution what will advance you and what will not. Um, and, um, you know, you don't need a list of rules written on a wall uh, so that the hierarchy of an institution like the New York Times is dominated by people who are careerists, whose uh, loyalty is to their own advancement uh, rather than to the truth. And yet, uh, all great journalistic institutions need those reporters who care about truth. Uh, David K. Johnson, you know, Sidney Shanberg, who I mentioned before, I mean, they were there. Uh, what happens is that they often eventually have a confrontation with that institution. Uh, and because they have that kind of integrity, um, they're often cast, usually cast aside by that institution. Okay, in the next segment of our interview with Chris, we're going to start the discussion about what should be done. And we're going to talk a little bit about Christian anarchism and some of Chris's philosophical beliefs. Please join us for this next segment of our interview with Chris Hedges on The Real News Network.